Broadcasting from East Tennessee and Northern Alabama, you're listening to Justified Radio, where each week we look at today's issues through the lens of God's Word. Justified Radio. Justified Radio. It's where life meets the Bible. And this is Justified Radio. David, I'm sitting here. It's 10.30 p.m. in Kingsport, and I'm drinking a cup of caffeinated coffee. Bless your heart. Yeah. So, no, I'm drinking water because so, uh, when we get done, I'm going to bed. It's well, only apparently I'm not. Da- it's only 9.30 down here. I mean, I've got the whole night ahead of me. <laughs> no, apparently I'm going to sit up for a little while, but <laughs> but that's okay. How are you doing this evening? Good. Doing real good. Yeah, I had a good weekend and uh, had, uh, you know, had a good time with you yesterday doing a Justified, been a busy today doing some work here around the house and looking forward to doing justified tonight so i've had a great day right and and you've been busy you uh you preach down in huntsville and then i think you're getting ready to come to kingsport i am yeah i'll be in kingsport i'll I'll be preaching the 24th but uh, i'll be up there this coming sunday which is whatever it is uh well we may even podcast be or it may you may be here and gone before this even gets published right yeah, but but hopefully while I'm there, we can do another one. So yeah, oh, another one live in the same room. Yeah, another live in the same room in the in the A studio. Yeah, in the studio A. That's yeah. a big operation, Justified yeah. Radio. Oh, sure. Yeah, we're worldwide. We're, yes, we are. <laughs> we we are accessible yeah, across boy, the world. Hey, everybody, better remember that when you get on line, you're worldwide. <laughs> yes, whatever you do, people in China, Korea. The Soviet Union, they're going to know it if they want to. Well, and and that is true. And yeah. you know what? We really, not just, you know, you and I podcasting, but but people should remember that. Yeah, that, it always, uh, it's always amazed me when people say, well, how, how did people, hey, they know where you are. Yeah, they do. We keep these cell phones with us. We have our computers with us. But this isn't conspiracy stuff. It's fact. If you've got your computer with you, your phone with you, about anybody can find out where you are. Well, and, and you know, I, I remember, well, I remember having a conversation with uh, uh, some Eastern European visitors to the church. And anyway, we were, they were talking about all these things and, uh, and the COVID vaccine came up and Anyway, they they made the uh, comment the COVID vaccine had metal in it, and that the government was using five G to track you from the metal of the COVID vaccine, and 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 you know, frankly, my opinion, silly talk. Some, and I thought, you know what? You don't have to worry about the vaccine. You don't need to worry about the non-existent metal or the five G. You're wearing a tracking device on your hip. Right. They 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 know where you are. They're listening in on your conversations. So they read your email, your text. You don't have to worry about this other stuff. You're you're carrying, yeah. you know, here, you're you're carrying it right there on your hip. Oh yeah, yeah. How does Siri know when you say, and I won't even say it because she'll answer. <laughs> but but it, she's always in the background listening, waiting for your beck and call, and you know. And, if, if you and I were were talking about. Re- you know, if you were talking about replacing that Indian motorcycle with the Triumph this evening, just just in conversation, the next thing you know, you'd be getting advertisements for new motorcycles. Yeah, guarantee it. Guarantee so, it. And there you go. Before. So when this yeah. well, when this pops up, you can thank me now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's happened before. But everybody worries about that. But you know what we really ought to be thinking more about than anything? There is one who tracks us. And knows our every move, our every thought, our every action. As a matter of fact, there's one who knows what we're going to do before we do it. And that's I'm the gl- great God of all creation. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the same people who get freaked out with the idea that someone else may, may know too much about them don't seem to be bothered that God knows everything. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, when you, I mean, we do things, this is not, I, I'm not one of those gloom and doomers, but we do things to disappoint him every day. He's he's seeing us. He's there. He's He knows when we're not praying, when we're not reading our Bible, when we thought about reading our Bible, but then thought, oh, but wait a minute, anything else, you know. Okay, and thought. You, you mentioned something there because, you know, yeah. 
okay, the phone listens, you know, they track location and everything. But God knows your thoughts. Yeah. No one else knows your thoughts. And, and I'm glad because there's a lot of people who'd really be disappointed in me if they, you know, could read my mind at any given time. Well, I'm disappointed myself sometimes because I know what my mind wanders to. But that's, isn't it glorious that we have a God of grace, though? Yes. I, I was a, a fella down here. It's a, it's a big church down here. And he was on TV the other day and he was doing this commercial and he was all theatrical and everything. But he said, you know, here at, and he named his church, he said, we serve a God of second chances. I hate that statement. Because we serve a God of the thousandth chance. Yes. It's not just second. It's, I mean, honey, we, we burned through that second probably about an hour after we were born again. <laughs> we do. And then sometimes, David, because I'm, I'm naturally <laughs> cynical, we serve a forgiving God. But at the same time, I think sometimes people stress that for the one the wrong reason because we get that mindset of, well, we're just going to go out and live any way we want to because we just want to experience God's grace even more. And the only way we can experience the, the full measure of God's grace is to continually sin and put ourselves in the situation that we need to experience it. Isn't it interesting that people really honestly think that Rasputin, the, you know, he was big on that. He was a heretic, but I mean, he, he had the czars of Russia, they were, you know, following his every thought, you know, thinking he was a holy man. But the Holy Spirit knew this a long time ago, that these things would happen. And to Paul, the Holy Spirit said, Paul needs you to write this down, write it to the Roman church and say, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Then it says, may it never be. That's very strong language, too, in the original language. May it never be. God, some, some translations, I think the King James says, God forbid. I think so. Yeah, but it's very strong language. No, don't ever presume upon God's grace as an allowance to continue in your sin. No, see, hey, what do you have to do to be saved? Well, we know you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You also have to be willing to repent. Jesus right. said that. <laughs> well, and well, you know, we've we've always you and I both know, um, you know, this this easy uh, believerism. Uh, you know, God doesn't care if you you change your life or not. And you know what? God loves us un unconditionally. I believe that because the Bible teaches us that. But you know, a lot of people think that God loves me just the way that I am. He does, but he doesn't want me to stay the way that I am. No. No, he loves you way too much to leave you like he found you. Right. Yep. So it just it just reminds us that listen, there's there's a lot, all of us, all the children of God, there's a lot more Bible study, you know, that oh, we yeah. all need to do. Yeah, well, and a lot more obedience to it and, too. You know, reading it if you, if if you just read it and it doesn't change you, you've not done a thing. Well, you know, and, and that's where you get to the book of James. And certainly we do not believe in a works-based salvation. But I do believe that, that if you're saved, if, if there's no evidence of that, if there's no, you know, if there's no uh, uh, evidence, no works in your life, then, then truly you need to question whether or not you have actually been saved. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, that, that everybody, and I, that always amazes me. People try to make out like James and Paul were at odds. Read the whole letter to James, uh, that James wrote, I mean. He, he didn't believe in works-based salvation. He believed in grace. But he understood that a person who's experienced grace, I mean, my goodness, you, suddenly your sins are forgiven. Heaven's waiting for you. You've been cleansed. You've been made a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Everything's become new. And you're going to live like you used to? No. Well, I, I I never could understand. I always I, I I'd always heard, I guess, or, or read somewhere that uh, that I believe Luther Luther had a problem with uh, the book of James. It was a, a straw yeah. epistle, and I thought Luther of all people, I just I just can't understand how he he just could not read the the epistle of James and and see that that it's not promoting a works based salvation. I I think it reads very very eloquently the message he's trying to convey. Yeah, sure does. I mean, 
Well, and Paul, they, you know, then they turn on Paul and they say, well, he's just a preacher of grace. And they'll always quote, you'll hear people always quote, we're all famously guilty of this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one could boast. Well, read the next verse. Yes. <laughs> we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. I mean, that's as clear as you can get it. Well, we're we're real bad about that. I mean, we yeah we we live our lives one verse at a time. Get your favorite verse and quote it, and you know make it your own. Don't you know? Don't worry about the context of its delivery. <laughs> don't worry about who it was spoken to. You know precisely. Just just grab it, make it your own. Well, you better be careful with that. I have favorite verses. Sure, I but, do too. But this ideal, you know, a lot of people, you know, they believe in this ideal of a of a life verse or something like that, and and you've you've got to be very very careful, yeah, uh, about just picking out a, a verse out of context and and then running with it. Yeah, my my favorite verse is, and it, it literally at a time in my my ministerial life, it changed my life. Um, you know, Paul was talking to the Galatians, and he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And, man, I think about that a lot. When he died on that cross, I died with him. I mean, in a very real way, I died with him. When he rose from the dead, I rose with him. You say, now, wait a minute. That was at least 2,000 years before you were born, right? <laughs> and that's an amazing thing that God did for me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh well but that's our commentary for the night that's Thank you know you. that's the introduction to whatever <laughs> yeah. we're going to speak on <laughs> we we that's okay though yeah uh, yeah that's why i mean that's a you know justified radio sometimes it's me and phil talking about things that you probably have talked about or would like to talk about with somebody else and that's why and, we and, always try to tell you to communicate with us because we'd love to talk with you about these things you know, everyone should have someone or a small group that they, they do talk about the things of God with. They they do talk about the, the deep things yeah. of God and, and, you know, that you can trust to have these conversations and, and realize that sometimes, you know, it may not make sense or you might go down the wrong path, but uh, that, that you can discuss it with one another. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you got Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans, um, I don't say Episcopalians anymore. I think they've all gone off the rail. But, uh, but you know, you got Catholics. We've got all kinds of people. We differ in, in a, sometimes in a lot of the things we teach and believe. But well, those things we, that we, draw us together, man, they're tightly bound. You know, we, we say Episcopalians, but but you know there is uh, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of Anglicans in the United States. And you know, it used to be the Episcopalians. We just looked at them as being. Yeah, the American version of the Anglican Church, but you know a lot of the scholars, a lot of the authors that you read, they were they were Anglican, and uh, and if there's one thing we don't do enough of, I think, is we we don't have these these uh, conversations with uh, fellow Christians from different uh, you know different faith traditions, and we ought to. Yeah, we ought to. That's why I love reading uh, John Lennox. He's Church of England. You know, what a lot of people don't know. I mean, C.S. Lewis was Church of England. Yes. Uh, C.S. Lewis, great, great theologian. He wouldn't say he was a theologian, but he was. Right. Uh, but, you know, C.S. Lewis believed in purgatory. Peter Kreeft, one of my favorite writers, is a Catholic, um, a Catholic teacher, I think, at Boston University. Um teaches theology and philosophy, I believe, but he, I love to read Peter Kreef, but he believes in, uh, of course, he, the veneration of Mary. Uh, he believes in purgatory. Um, you know, several of the things that are strong Catholic doctrines that I don't agree with at all. But that doesn't mean I won't read his stuff because, man, the things he talks about, he talks with a lot of clout. Well, even the things that we disagree on, you know, sometimes that, that clarifies that, that makes it even clearer to you that, you know, this is why I believe this, uh, or why I don't believe this or why I don't believe it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and what I have very short patience anymore, it seems like with people, you know, the older I get, the more, 
is, is this ideal of I believe what I believe simply because I was told this when I was a child and, and I can't defend it, I can't explain it, but, you know, there and, you know, we're all called to be theologians. Yeah. Uh, yeah the choice born, is whether if, or not we're going to be a good or a bad theologian. Right. I mean, that's any person that's a born again believer. You know, the Bible is your docu- document of faith. I mean, this is what this is what we turn to to know the mind of God. Don't don't sit out in your try to do a, <clears throat> some kind of mantra thing and think God's going to speak to you that way. No, He's giving you His Word. Uh, he primarily deals with us through His Word, from His Word, and uh, and and that's how He talks to us. Well, and and again, that's a that's a whole another conversation. But there are a lot of Christians. There there are some that uh, you know uh, uh, are very uh, experience based or experiential. Uh, they don't care really anything about you know reading the Bible, studying the Bible. Uh, you know, they're all about whatever they feel the Holy Spirit's revealing to them at the time. Yeah, and and, that, and again, that's why the Bible warns you: be careful of the spirits you listen to. Yes. Because well, Satan's very deceptive. Uh, Satan and his demons are very deceptive. And I've said something that some people almost, well, they almost thought I was a heretic because I said it, but I, I still believe this. you got to be careful because sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between God speaking to you and Satan speaking to you. That's why you have to have your Bible. Yes, or or, you know, or you speaking to yourself in in that we have we have a sinful nature ourselves and and you know sometimes what we feel led to do we lead ourselves astray yeah and um what what's the favorite term for uh, extra marital or uh you know sex outside of marriage whatever what what do we call it making love right okay god's love See, that's deceptive. Making love? No, you're you're fornicating. Anything outside of the relationship of a man and a woman who are brought together under under God Almighty, any sexual activity outside of that is fornication or uh, wh- whatever you want to call it. But it's it's sin. Well, you know when when we we talk about an experiential faith, you know when when we. You know, we look upon the Bible, but but we also give as as much uh, authority to experience as we do the Word of God. And then some people do, uh, you know, tradition, experience, logic, you know, or reason. But uh, but then you then you make these you make these outlandish claims, David. You know, a husband and wife they have problems. Uh, you know, they make the statement. I just feel that that you know the Lord was leading us to you know end our marriage and go our separate. No, never. No, he he doesn't do that. He would no, he, would be he may not have he'd be violating his word if he right. did that. Uh, his and I've I've said it just as plainly as that his will may have been for you never to have married, but but his will is not for you or not for it to have ended up in divorce. Right. Uh, so, but but we got to be careful about that. And but people do, don't they? They just kind of do whatever they want to and attribute it to God and. Well, that's one of the great principles of Bible study that Tony teaches a lot that he gleaned from W.A. Criswell and others, and I'm sure Criswell gleaned it from, well, or put it together with things he'd read and heard. But, you know, one of the main of those five principles for studying the Bible is always interpret your experience by the Word of God. Never interpret Instead the Word of, the other of God way. by your experience. Right. And and I just I remember I I, I really I, this has been a while but I remember reading I guess the beginning of uh, oh, it was MacArthur's book uh, Charismatic Chaos mm-hmm. yeah and uh, telling the story of his father in a, a motel room opening up the drawer pulling out the Gideon's Bible opening it up and somewhere on the the flyleaf someone has written I don't care what the Bible says I've had an experience yeah dangerous so extremely dangerous right. Uh, David, we had started talking, and we went long uh, last time. We're going to go long. Well, we'll say what needs to be said. We're not watching a clock. But uh, we were talking about calling deacons, calling elders, pastors, overseers. And the last episode, we had talked about how deacons were called by the church, but how an elder or pastor 
how God calls us. Mm-hmm. You, you were called by God. I was called by God. Right. Um, and, and we talked about answering that call, you know, but we said the next episode, you know, this one, we want to talk about the church's responsibility or the, the part the church plays in the calling of a, a pastor or an elder into ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it seems that, and we've said this a little bit, but it's something, it seems that churches have forgot what they are supposed to do when they're trying to call a pastor. We used to have a committee that came together, and it's called a search committee. Well, it seems that search committees in today's culture just sit back and wait for another resume to come in on their uh, computer. I mean, I I know of churches that have done that. The church that I left did that. Um, That's a very poor way to, to do a search. You know, you should be looking for people in your geographical area, I think. Now I think, and I'm, and I could be wrong. Um, but you know, look at and see somebody that's, you know, they're preaching the doctrine of God. They're staying in the Bible. They're, they're, they're mentoring people through what they preach and teach. Um, and then churches, they, they ought to be looking for that rather than just waiting for a resume to come across because resumes are deceptive at times. I mean, anybody should know that. Well, yes, and, and you know, I, I guess we'll go back a little bit further and say that, you know, when it, when it comes to the calling of a, a pastor or elder, that God calls, and, and that man, you know, experiences this calling in his life and, and announces this calling, but that is, but it's affirmed by the church. Mm-hmm. You know, if if call if God has has called you into ministry, He will provide you with a congregation, and and so the church, you know, the the church affirms, I guess, in that man's life. You just don't announce, "I'm going to be a pastor." Hand me an ordination paper, without a congregation somewhere calling you. And and so when that congregation, when that church is looking for someone. You know that process begins with just like you said. Let's let's set up some type of a search committee, and here here's the process we're going to to go through. Yeah, and that's and it's and two you you want to when you do have it narrowed down and you've got some candidates or a candidate that you believe that that God's gonna you know you're, you're kind of being led to this person. You should have a very extensive time of learning the doctrinal beliefs of the person who you're going to call to be your pastor. It shouldn't be a meeting right before the night you ordain that person to be the pastor. Yes, I have. Well, okay. There's a couple of things there. One is, is you need to have this extensive conversation sometime well before you're going to, to call this person. Now, to have that conversation, that means that you have got to be you have got to be grounded enough in the doctrine of your particular church that you can have this conversation with this person. Right. Yeah, you gotta know what you believe and why you believe it. You you mentioned, I think, once before in one of our episodes, you mentioned that there was a local church that they're getting they're they're getting ready to to call a man. I mean their their mind, you know, this was a done deal, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they found out that his beliefs concerning, you know, uh, concerning end times doctrine. Right. Uh, he he believed just, we were in the midst of the tribulation now. And there are people who believe that. But yeah. that didn't that didn't job with, with their doctrine as a congregation. Right, and there are people that believe that, but it shouldn't jive with anybody's Doctrine well, understanding because the Bible's very clear. I mean, you, well, you don't. Oh, this is bad times. No, it's not. You want to see bad times? Wait till the tribulation is here. Well, and I, and I th- I think that's one of the things that when a church starts looking for a pastor, first of all, first of all, they have to settle on what they're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Here's the things that are important to us. You know, how do they view the Bible? You know, uh, what do they think about the the deity, the humanity of Christ? Things that we used to take, you know, we'd almost take for granted, but but you can't anymore. 
Um, well, we did take it for granted, and it's been made very evident to me here in the last few years that we did take it for granted to the detriment of some churches. Had a right. good friend, a great friend that I love dearly, and we we talked about this extensively. He he he. Had, we went out to eat one day, and he was talking to him, and he said, Dave, he said, there's something you say a lot, and uh, I've never heard it before. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, you you talk like you believe Jesus was God. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I talk like he was God. I should be talking like he is God. He's always been God. And I said, yeah, I believe that. Uh, and he said, well, I've never heard that. Uh, growing up, I was in church a lot, and I never heard that. And I said, well... I'm sorry, but that's not my fault. That's the fault of the people that were preaching her. Then he said, well, I've talked to some of the guys. They, there was a bunch of them got together. You know how some of us do. We get together and eat breakfast, and it was a group. He said, I mentioned it in that group, and none of those had heard of it either. And I said, well, that's that again, that's not my problem. But if they want to talk about it, tell them to holler at me because they need to understand that Jesus is God. Well, see, now, okay, you and I, uh, to me, I, uh, it's one of those things that I just take it for granted that, yeah. that every Christian believes that Jesus is God. The Bible teaches that. Um, I remember reading an interview. I don't think I was watching. I believe I was reading an interview when out of the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, there began, there, there came out this cooperative Baptist fellowship. Yeah. More, more uh, biblically liberal, you know. And uh, and they were having one of their meetings, and someone who was speaking there made the statement that he did not. And he was a okay on the surface. He's a Baptist preacher. He's he he's me and you. You know, he's a Baptist preacher. And he said he didn't preach from the Gospel of John at all, because the Gospel of John stressed the deity of Christ, and he didn't believe that Christ was deity, that he was God. Yeah, and right there, a man has disqualified himself from even being a. A preacher, much less a pastor. But well, you, you just you got to be careful. Yep. Yeah, that's you know that uh, you, you 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 know which means that a church you know when a church is looking for a pastor they're they're at a particularly vulnerable time. Yeah. Uh, be, because because for the most part, for most churches, the person who is the most well versed in in biblical doctrine is leaving and now they're left to find someone else and oftentimes they find themselves not equipped to ask the right questions or to to vet the candidates yeah i know a church that in their search criterion as far as their documents are concerned they're they're uh, uh i mean this is written in their i guess it would be in their bylaws Right, I think, but it's a requirement in that church that the pastor they call is a graduate of a Southern Baptist seminary. Honey, you can't trust in uh, just because somebody's graduated from a seminary that they believe the Bible, that they believe Jesus is God, that they believe He's the only way. You can't trust that anymore. I don't know if you ever could, but you, you certainly can't now. Well, I I don't know that you ever. You know you. I don't know that you ever could. Now, that's not to say, you know, all things were bad, but but you can't take a, a particular institution and think that everyone coming out of there has the same beliefs, that they're going to do they're going to do your vetting for you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know no, because they don't. I mean, they certainly don't. You know, uh, you, you find uh, you, you find in Southern Baptist churches, you, you, you know, you, you find a lot of different doctrine now. And uh, and frankly, you find a lot of, of Calvinism. You know, you find a lot of Reformed congregations, and you know, th- there for a while, uh, it was not unusual uh, that you would get someone who who leaned toward Calvinism out of out of a seminary, especially you know, uh, a couple of them in particular. But th- when they would interview for you know, uh, with the search committee or whatever, they they would not reveal that. Right. And, uh, and, you know, in, unless you knew how to, how to ask the right questions, how to understand their language, and we've talked about this before, the difference between the Bible is the Word of God and the Bible contains the Word of God, yeah. uh, that, that they'll just, you know, they just won't admit to it what you're trying to ask if you don't know how to ask it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, one thing, if you don't get anything else out of this, please know that the church you're in, and if you're in a church for any period of time at all, you're going to go through a pastor transition. I guarantee yes. it. And and you need to understand that that search committee, that's a very important um, group of people. And, and you need to support them, you need to pray for them, but you need to make sure they know what they believe and they know what the church believes. My, my advice to, frankly, my advice to any church would be seek outside help yep. from someone that you trust that, that you know, uh, may, be, may be better qualified to, to help you, you know, go through all these candidates and everything and, and to make sure, you know, that you're asking the right questions and getting the right answers. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's important. I mean, you, you spoke about Calvinism. We've got we're so paranoid around here anymore, and especially in Southern Baptist life. Hey, please don't think that just because a person's a Calvinist that they're a heretic. I mean, a lot well, of the things they believe, we believe. You know, and and I, I really did say that kind of wrong because you know all I think just about every one of us could to an extent say, okay, listen, I'm a two point three point four point Calvinist mm -hmm. using the the TULIP acronym. Best, the best I can tell, there's only three branches in the church that everybody's a part of. And one is the Calvinistic branch. One's Arminian. Uh, Calvinistic are like us Presbyterians. believe that you're saved by grace alone. You're kept by grace alone. It's all God's work. Uh, Arminians, and this is just a general. It's You can't pin it down, but Arminians believe you can lose your salvation. Those are free will Baptists. A lot of the Church of God, a lot of Pentecostals, uh, Methodists, uh, and then there's Catholicism, and that's the three. I don't, uh, listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of one of those three groups, whether you want to admit it or not. I don't know that. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to to find Catholicism in between Calvinism and Arminianism. Oh no, I think here you got the two here: Calvinism, Arminianism, and then right. then Catholicism. But but that's the pretty much, or at least okay. from I, my understanding, that's the, about the only three. Okay, I see what you're saying. See, I, yeah. I would say, well, you have, at least within Baptist circles or Baptistic churches, Arminianism, Calvin, Calvinism, and then in between, in, in between the two extremes, you know, okay, we would say someone who was, who was free will Arminian that, that they put too much emphasis on, on man's part. Right. Okay, someone who who leans what we would call Calvinistic, you know, uh, predestination. It's all the the sovereignty of God, and and frankly, they're not wrong. But, and and then I find myself in the middle on that spectrum, which is, you know, does God choose man or does man choose God? And to me, the answer to both those questions is, yes, yes, yeah. Can't explain it, but. But, you know, but that's kind of in the middle. Yeah, I live um, Psalm 27, verse 8 says, and this is the psalm of speaking, and this is an inserted part at the very beginning, the when you said part, but this is the way that verse is translated. When you said, and this is the psalm of speaking to God, when you said, God, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. It's almost a... a a parallel, if you will, or a, an instantaneous movement on both part. God said, yes. search for me. Your heart said, I'm searching for God. I mean, it, it, that's the way it works. Uh, like I said, it's, you know, it, it's unexplainable. Uh, you know, it's like, I think we would, we would say, well, the Trinity, the Bible clearly teaches the Trinity. It doesn't use the word Trinity, but, but it teaches the doctrine of Trinity. Uh, can we understand it? No. Not, not in the fullest way, but oh. but you should understand at least that it's a true doctrine. Yes, you know? but but you know, can you you know explain how it works or no? no. You know, no. You, how 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 God can be one God, three persons? But the Bible clearly teaches that. Well, sure. Uh, Either that or like C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was insane. One of the two. Because, Lord liar or lunatic. Uh, Lord yeah. liar or lunatic, and uh, and I'm I know he wasn't a liar. 
um, I, 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 I'd be ashamed to say that I thought he was a lunatic. And that only leaves him to be Lord, and he is Lord of my life. Well, you know, you you and I, I think, would agree that, you know, uh, uh, Christian orthodoxy or, you know, what we would consider necessary Christian belief is a belief in the Trinity. Uh, there are there are those now that, that deny Trinity. Uh, at one time, what we would do is we wouldn't even have a problem with label them, labeling them heretics, that, that we do not share the same faith. Uh, what we see anymore, though, is we have gotten so far away from, from people really understanding doctrine and things that, that people don't even bat an eye at those types of things anymore, though they should. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what do people say about Mormons? And they're correct when they say this. They say, well, that's some of the best people I've ever met. Absolutely, yep. they are. There's no doubt about that. I'll go out on a limb here and say this. I don't really believe this, but it's true. Jehovah's Witnesses are nice people, but they're lost as a golf ball in high weeds, both Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe Jesus was God. They don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe the Bible's sufficient. You say, no, oh, wait a minute. They use the King James Bible. Yeah, and they use the Pearl of Great Price and other Testament of Jesus Christ. And if I'm not mistaken, two others that are necessary reading for a Mormon, uh, Jehovah's Witness, their, their Bible is an aberration of the King James Bible. Poor old uh, uh, Taze Russell, he took the Bible and he looks at it and he don't believe in the Trinity, so he goes through and anywhere that declared Jesus to be God, Jesus to be equal to the Father, he changed the wording, did it in John chapter 1. In the beginning, the true Bible says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Well, Taze Russell changed the New World Translation and it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Well, right. Uh, it's just wrong. No, I mean, we would, we, I mean, we would literally say we, we don't share the same faith. We don't worship the same God. Those are, you know, those are things that, that we just cannot compromise on. No. Now, when it comes to calling, say, when it comes to calling a pastor, though, or, or an elder— um, and I'm, I keep using the terminology pastor. That's generally, you know, you don't have an elder search committee. You don't, I don't think in those terms. But, but then you get to to those things where churches differ in doctrine, and and you know what? It's okay. Uh, we won't break fellowship with them or something like that. But but what an individual church? I think what they they have to do is they have to settle on this is the doctrine of our particular congregation. Yeah. And and we want someone, you know, we're going to call someone who agrees with our particular, uh, the way we understand doctrine. So, listen, if I'm a free will Baptist, I'm not. But if I'm a free will Baptist, I'm not going to call a Calvinist minister. No. If if I'm if if I'm reformed, I'm not going to call someone who who is free will in their beliefs. No. Uh, we coexist, but but there's why the church itself, that particular congregation, they have to know as a church, as a congregation, what they believe, what what doctrine they hold to, and then ensure that they bring in the man, you know, that they're looking for that is in agreement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it's listen, it's tremendously important. So if your church is going through a a search, please know that that search committee is a very important group. They need to be prayed for. Uh, they need to be encouraged. They need to be helped. You know, I mean, if they call for help, people should help them. Um, right. You know, well, no, we're the committee. We'll take care of it. You better be careful with that, too. Well, and, and you know, in a practical sense, Dave, okay, typical search committee nowadays, how long is it going to take for a church to find a pastor? It's, in today's culture, what I'm hearing is usually over a year. That's could be shorter, but but I mean you but but you you may be looking at a year or two, which means that there has to be some patience to the process too, because the last thing you want to do is get rushed. Yeah, yeah, and panic. I mean, you know, right? right. Yeah, because again, there's there's just not that many out there that want to be the the lead elder, the pastor of a church anymore. Now, there's a lot of people want to preach. Okay, there's a lot of people you can get for Sunday morning or Wednesday nights or even Sunday night. 
but it's a different matter when you're calling somebody that will be the what what we tend to refer to as the lead elder, uh, the preaching well, pastor. What, what we you yeah. right? I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there are just not that many of them out there anymore. Well, and and frankly, that's a discussion too. That okay, like you said, a lot of people want to preach. But as far as the responsibility of being a pastor and elder, uh, everything's changed. It is, you know, uh, you the churches don't have the same respect uh, that they did. The community doesn't have the same respect. Uh, the The pressures, what people expect anymore, the expectations are different than they've ever been. Uh, they can come and listen to David Sally two times on last Sunday morning. And the thing is, is they're going to go home, they're going to flip on YouTube, and now all of a sudden they're comparing David Sally to David Jeremiah. Yeah. You know, you used to not, you know, you go back 20, 30 years, you didn't have that same kind of, that same kind of pressure, I guess. Well, no, it is pressure. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I've told people before, they, well, I listen to Charles Stanley. I said, I love to listen to Charles Stanley. I mean, you know, if I had to make a choice between who to sit under, whether it was Charles Stanley or David Sally, I'd choose Charles Stanley every time. And and the vast majority of people have, or Charles Stanley over Phil Woodham, right? Well, yeah, yeah, but but they're equating sitting at home and watching with being in the congregation and participating. And there's a right. big difference there. Everybody needs a church. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs to be, every born again believer needs to be a part of a church. There are no lone rangers out there. There shouldn't be. And uh, we need to make sure we're understanding that. People need to come to the church. So, therefore, we need, as pastors, we need to feed them when they come. Now, here's the thing I've heard people say before, and I've even answered them when they said, well, they're in this church or that church, maybe even my church, and they, they or not my church, but the church I pastored. And they would say, well, I'm just not being fed. Let me tell you about that, honey. Sometimes the food's on the table and it's up to you to pick up your fork and knife and feed yourself. I was reading an article, can't remember where it was, but uh, but it was, you know, it, it was a list of the most hurtful things you can tell your pastor. Mm-hmm. And one of those is, I'm just not being fed anymore. Yeah. And, and okay. And, and in my mind, and then we'll have to, (laughs) we're, we're about 45 minutes in or 43 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) But, 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 but in my mind, what I want to do is, is I want to have a, an object lesson on a Sunday morning and I want people to, to turn over to, to the back of their bulletins and, and write down what they expect from the service this morning realizing that most people won't write anything down. Yep. And 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 in my mind, you know, I'm going to preach and at the end I'm going to say, "Okay, now, you know, turn over to your bulletin, see what you wrote down, what you expected today." And for those of you who didn't write anything down, well, you got what you wanted, didn't there you? There you go. <laughs> that'd be a good that'd be a good option. No, it wouldn't be a good one. No, it's terrible. Ah, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sometimes they need sometimes we need to be woke and uh what well, Okay, you you tend to get what you want. Yeah. Um, you know, back before I started preaching, when when I was attending, uh, what I found myself is Lisa and I, when we started back to church, when we were married in our twenties, we started at the very back of the sanctuary, up in the balcony against the the block wall, and what I found was was I started moving forward. The closer I got to the front, the more that I got out of it every Sunday until I'm right up there on the front pew. And, and what I found out, David, is if I came in with expectation to be blessed by the message, I was. Yeah. And it was a whole lot less about the message being brung than, than me spiritually preparing myself to, to receive a blessing, to receive that message that morning. Yeah. And if you come in and, all soured up, not expecting anything again, that's exactly what you're going to get. Uh, yeah, you won't go away disappointed, no, you'll, will you? You'll well, but he didn't do anything well, yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, you you'll go away. No, he didn't. But. Well, I hope this has helped. I mean, uh, just understand what Phil and I are trying to impress is the fact that search committees are very important positions. Um, calling a lead elder, whatever you want to call it, pastor. 
uh, that's a very important work that a church goes through and can be a very hard work, but, uh, but it's a well, it is, and and you know maybe we'll we'll have to move on, but but we can still touch a little bit, I guess, on, on you know once once you settled on that person, because I I think we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the ordaining process, and uh, and something you mentioned before we started recording, but has never talked about, which is the the ordaining church, that is ordaining that that man to you know serve in that church. Their responsibilities after the fact, uh, because I, I think we agree. I think there's there's some responsibility after you've ordained someone, yeah, uh, to kind of keep track of them and and you know uh, to make sure that they've been they've been true to the word and true to what they've been charged with. Yeah, when you give them that ordination paper, it's not well. Here you go. You're on your own. Thank you. Glad we got this behind us. No, that's just the but, beginning. But that's how it. we treat it. Is it, it is? But that's that's just the beginning of the relationship. So, so anyway, join us again because, um, uh, like I said, some of these things, you know what, it's nitty gritty, David, but it, I think it's exciting to talk about and it's very interesting, but it's very necessary. I do too. I do too. So, so join us again. Uh, again, you can find all our information. You can find past episodes, justifiedradio.org. And so until the next time, David, I always say shalom. You always do. God bless. You've been listening to Justified Radio, where life meets the Bible. You can find us on the web at justifiedradio.org, where you can submit questions, subscribe to the podcast, and find links to our social media. That's justifiedradio.org. Until next time, thanks for listening. 